nicely from everything that was said before. Um, so who am I? Um, my name is Inga Ploma. I'm a software developer, not an educator. But I have a passion for mentoring. So I mentor a lot for users called GS in Sydney and women who code. And I also organize a couple of game development uh, groups. So I'm very passionate about bringing people into dev. Also, I'm a Corgi owner, if you're wondering. And he always has to be in my slides because he's a Corgi. What do you expect? So um, I'm here to share my experience working on a non-commercial project uh, and talk a bit about difference between commercial and non-commercial educational projects that we're currently running. So um, you can imagine the main difference between commercial and non-commercial projects is money. Because on uh, non-commercial projects, uh, on commercial projects, people work for, like, work for self-growth. Uh, they work for... Um, the interest, their own interests, and for money. So if you take money out of equation, you're only left with self-growth and learning. So uh, I think it's an interesting uh, question that you can actually ask yourself, even at your workplace, what will happen if I take money out of equation? Who will actually stay in the project? So uh, that's what I'm trying to uh, point you towards in this talk, to think about commercial uh, and to think of what we can learn from non-commercial projects and apply it to commercial projects. So this talk is based on my uh, personal project called Bitva. It's a computer game, and it started from a very simple idea. I just wanted to make my own game, and I posted on Facebook, like, who wants to join me? And a couple of my friends just got excited, like, we definitely want to participate in this. We have zero programming experience. I'm like, okay, we'll see what we can do. And then more people joined. And they also had zero programming experience. So as a result, uh, instead of just making a game, it became this educational project with a distributed team that's like all across the globe. So it was uh, pretty interesting. Uh, just a small insight into a project. Uh, over the course of the project, which is about two years now, we had about 50 plus members. So people are joining, they're learning what they want to learn, and they move on. So uh, some of the people who joined with zero experiences now, zero experience now have jobs in the industry just because they like worked on this project. It helped them to build their confidence and actually go and find jobs. Um, so we usually have about 10 active members at every time. And by active members, I mean people who are currently developing the project, not the people who just joined and learning uh, how to get in or not people who learned and left. So generally, it's like around 10 people who are working on animations, working on arts, working on the code, on sounds, and everything. So uh, in the first year, we actually completed our minimum viable product, and it had a very strict scope. That's the only reason we were actually able to finish it. But then uh, we had a conversation. We decided not to release it. We decided to work on it a bit more because there are some other interesting, as I said, main focus was learning, and we decided that there are more things that we can learn from it. So yes, we're working on a network game now because no one in the team has any experience with networking, so we just had to fix it. And uh, we went through two big cycles of refactoring uh, because personally, I think refactoring is very important for junior developers because it actually helps them to see how much they're grown over time. So I'm a big, fa big fan of refactoring and automated tests, but more on that later. So it's a hot seat game based on Russian folklore. That's actually the previous version of UI. We changed it a bit, but overall, that's a very simple card game. There is not much to it. Um, so main question that I had to ask myself even before the project started was, how the hell am I going to keep people interested in that if I'm not paying them? Uh, so, because programming is hard, and there's no money, and they have no experience. So, motiv finding motivation, finding a way to make sure people are staying in the project, and they're doing things, and they're growing, was very, very important. I want to share an important quote with you. Um, it's actually inspired me through the, through the process. I define a leader as anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and who has the courage to develop that potential. So this idea of helping people to develop their own potential was very important for me. I would say it was like the main reason, the main force behind the project for me. So 
How can you develop potential in programming in people who never programmed before? That was an interesting uh, question to solve, or problem to solve. So first, uh, I'm a big believer in information. So I actually started with a very detailed explanation of what roles in the project are and what can you do. And I just asked people to ask themselves this question. What do you actually want to do? We did not, as I said, we did not require any experience in the project. And more importantly, we did not require any commitment. So there was a try. Anyone could try any role in a project. Like today you want to do this, you want to learn front-end web development, perfect. Here are the learning resources, I'll teach you, I'll help you out. Tomorrow you want to move into UI experiences. Okay, here are the resources, you can try and do some UI if you want to. Uh, as a result, it actually had some amazing results because like two years into the project, my UX designers can do front-end, my front-end people can do back-end. So we got into cross-functional team just by not committing to a role. So another thing, uh, as you probably know, motivation is this very interesting sweet spot uh, that when you make sure that people are working on the edge of their knowledge, so they're always learning things, but they're never pushed into the zone when they don't know anything, so they're never lost. And with junior developers, with developers with no experience, it's really hard to find this spot because they don't know anything. The good thing is they will learn. And as they will learn, you will learn. You will know what motivates them. You will know how far you can push them and how do you react to those push pushes. Uh, the next step is very important for every team, commercial or non-commercial, is to have clear goals. Lucky for us, our goals were pretty clear from the beginning. It also links to the motivation. So our goals were first to learn, to learn the tech, to learn the process, to have this development experience. Second was to engage. And I don't mean engage players, I mean engage people who were in the project because it was a learning project. And as I said, motivation is very important in those conditions. And the third one was making a fun game. So every step that we took in the process was evaluated against those three goals. And um, as I said, they are prioritized. What I mean by that? Um, every question that we asked ourselves in relation to tech, we had to evaluate the answer against all of those metrics. First question, react for junior developers with no experience. Like, it's definitely not engaging because React is scary, especially if you have people who never wrote any line of JavaScript in their lives. But React is a very important technology that's very popular, so it's really nice to learn it. As a result, yes, we wanted React because it definitely aligned with our first goal, learning. Another example, should we focus on like test groups, focus groups, and player experience? Because it's very important when you're making a fun game, but we were not learning how to make a fun game. We were learning a tech stack. So we decided, eh, maybe our game won't be that fun, but we will focus on other things. The next important thing is to know your limits. It's very important to know what actually limits you. For us, clearly, the limit is <laughs> obvious. We had an experienced developers who had no idea what they're doing. Uh, and as a result, again, we tried to align it with everything that we were doing. That's how we got into unidirectional flow and step-driven architecture. So the li literally the limit was, how the hell am I going to explain it to juniors? So with that question in mind, we started making some decisions on our architecture. Another limit is engagement and support because managing, managing the level of interest was very important. Uh, so yeah, to keep the team engaged, we had to have something on the screen as soon as possible. Again, it affected our planning. For example, question, test-driven development. Should we apply it on front-end or back-end or both? The answer was yes on back-end, no on front-end. Because on front-end, we wanted to see something on the screen as soon as possible. Instead of writing the test for six months, yes, it would allow us to have more stable environment and more stable game, 
but I couldn't keep people interested in it for six months without showing them anything that's happening. So another important thing is immediate feedback for developers. What does that mean? Junior developers cannot look at the code and say if it's going to work or not. They're not there yet. And uh, even I'm not there yet, honestly. So uh, that's why we actually applied test-driven development on backend, because we have the very good test coverage. So the moment developer writes something, they run their tests, they immediately see, okay, the test passes, it's green, I can continue, or oh my god, the test is red, I should probably stop and fix it. Um, we also had immediate feedback, not just on code, but also on some game economy stuff. We had some simulations written to make sure that our game balance still works. So tests were very important for us to get this immediate feedback to see that our developers are doing the right thing. And as in any study project, it was very important to allow experiments as much as possible. That may be not the case for a commercial project because you probably don't want people breaking stuff all the time. But for a non-commercial project, that was very important because we wanted to make sure that people have a chance to explore, have a chance to see what they want to do and how to do the stuff they want to do. And another important limit is a communication. We are a remote team. We're not in one place, we're not in the one time zone, we're not in one continent. So we have developers in US, we have developers in Russia, we have developers in Europe, we have developers in Cyprus. So it was really, really hard to find, to build the communication. It's not just about finding a time for calls. It was how do you explain stuff to each other? How do you communicate ideas? So as a result, we drew a lot of boxes. Like every idea, every architectural decision that we tried to make, we started with that. We started with boxes, trying to explain what we're doing. Here is the example for um, what we did uh, a couple of months ago, uh, decoupling of our engine and our game terminal. So we started with boxes. That's how it is right now. Here are our players, here are our terminal, here's our engine. Then we're going through the steps, that's the second step, third step, and the result should be like this. So this, again, helps with communication and it also helps with onboarding because you can show this schema to a person and explain what's happening there and they understand it much better than if you just say it to them over, over a Skype call. And when you know your uh, limits, when you know your goals, you can build your architecture around it. So let's talk about design architecture for a bit more. So as I said, we went with uh, unidirectional data flow. We also went for some uh, specific technologies. That's actually why I'm here, because we went with Node on backend, Electron as a connector, and React on front end. Um, as I said, we went with state-driven project, and the moment I hear state, I immediately think React. So that was the question, for the answer for us. So here is the node. Electron, and um, so yeah, here's a short summary of Electron. Um, it starts the version of Chrome, and it allows you to connect to your node processes. Um, Slack, Atom, and I think Skype are built using Electron nowadays, so it's a pretty popular technology, and a lot of people are using it. So how did we apply it, and why it was important to get to this unidirectional data flow? As I said, we draw a lot of schemas and everything to explain stuff to people. So yeah, um, Electron gives you this very nice separation of duty, which is very important. Your um, front end communicates with Electron, then it goes to back end, your back end communicates with your game data, then it goes other direction, your back end sends your game's data through Electron to your front end, and then your front end draws the game. When it's needed, your front end takes the user input from the user and it sends it back. So as you can see, your data always goes one way and uh, your front end always sends actions to back end. So why was it important? It gives you a very clear separation of duty. You know your messages, you know what goes, you know what goes out, you know what goes in, so this way, your developers can actually work pretty independently. Like your backend knows that that's the messages that we're going to get, 
and that's the code that we have to write. Your front end knows, okay, that's the game data JSON that we're going to get, so we can work on that. Again, it helps with motivation because now people are not blocked on stuff. They're not waiting until backend finishes things, and they're not waiting until front end finishes things. They can work together, they can communicate and build things. So yeah, um, if you a web developer, you probably thought, okay, that sounds like Redux, and it totally does. We ended up not using Redux for, again, very important reason. How the hell am I going to explain Redux to juniors? Um, I decided it might be a bit difficult, and that's why we used Redux-like, but not Redux completely. As I said, you need to know your limits, and you need to evaluate your decisions against those limits. Uh, another important thing, and interesting decisions that were made. Um, we wanted to engage people participating in the project. We wanted to make sure that at every step of, step of the way they're interested. That's how we always keep like at least 10 members participating, because it's fun. Because, um, because they can experiment, because they can do things. And at the same time, we always try to make sure that our changes are safe. Uh, what does it mean? It means that our big picture doesn't suffer. Because when you work on a project, you write a code, then you go and pull it from a repo, and nothing works, that's not motivating, that's actually demotivating. So yeah, um, we solve this first with economy simulations. For those who don't know, they're pretty popular in game development. Uh, for us, it's a simple Monte Carlo simulation that anyone can write. It just uh, runs 100k random games. It shows you who's winning, who's losing, how often, and based on that you can see, like, okay, my game balance is good. No, my game balance is not good, I broke something. And this allows people to experiment, add their own cards, add their own characters, run the simulation, see if this character is too powerful or if this card is not powerful enough. And automated tests, as I said, we have pretty good coverage on backend. Um, we're still working on that. And again, it's not because we love testing. It's because we needed tools to make sure people are staying in the project, to make sure the project moves forward. And always iterate on all of those decisions. Are they still valid? Are they still working? Are they still doing what they're supposed to do? So the goal of this talk with this example was not to uh, was to show you that there are no perfect conditions. There are no perfect conditions if you're on educational project, there are no perfect conditions if you're on commercial project. But for your knowledge of those conditions, your understanding of what the, what the team is like, what are the people that you're working with, what do they want, how they want to proceed, what are they looking for, is very important. And that's what should actually affect your architecture. That's what should form your decisions, not, uh, oh, that's a cool tech, let's just play with that. Uh, so yes, commercial and non-commercial. Motivation is very important for non-commercial projects because otherwise it just won't get done. But it's also very important for commercial projects because if you have people who are already on your project, you probably want to keep them. You want to keep them engaged. Cross-functionality, um, it really depends on the project. Like, I'm a big fan of cross-functionality because I always work in slow, small teams, so it's very important to make sure we don't have a person who, like, if they fall out of the project, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. But maybe for, like, big enterprises, it's not that important. Clear goals are very important. Of course, they can be really different for commercial and non-commercial projects because uh, having fun with having a happy client, those are two different things, but still you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing. What's the reasoning behind all of your decisions? Understanding of your limits, limits are, well, is where, limits are where all the risks are. Like your limits actually define your risks. That's why you need to know them, that's why you need to analyze them and figure out how they should affect your decisions. And experiments. Let's be honest. On a commercial project, you want controlled experiments. You don't want people to run wild and break everything. 
but it's still important because we're in uh, development because we're passionate about it, because we want to create cool things, we want to write cool things, we love it. So being very strictive, being uh, confined to one, one task or one specific thing that you're doing can be very discouraging. So that's why I think experiments are important in both. And tests and refactoring. I personally think it's actually critical in a commercial project because in our non-commercial project, if the game breaks for two weeks and no one can download it, that's totally fine. That's just us, us, that's a pet project for us. If in a commercial project something doesn't work for two weeks, you're in trouble. So that's why for me, testing and refactoring all the time is very important for both of those projects. So how can you apply any of the stuff that I just told you about? Uh, first, ask yourselves with the team that you're currently in, what motivates your team members? What prevents them from progressing? And how those two things are reflected in your process. Are they reflected in your process? Are you actually asking yourself those questions? Also, try to figure out what's the main limitation on your project. Maybe it's time. Maybe it's a client. Maybe it's something else. But if you don't know, you cannot um, move your development further. You cannot make it better. You cannot actually iterate until you know all those answers. Know your limits, know your goals, align your decisions with those things. So that's the main idea of the talk. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Medium, LinkedIn. Uh, talk to me if you have any questions on uh, Electro <laughs> or non-commercial projects. And yeah, uh, Corgi Einstein is in there. Um, and it's Christmas. It's still Christmas here, so that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Any questions for me? Sure. Um, so how do you teach people all sort of tooling stuff that isn't cool and sexy and part of what they want to learn? Like, how do you teach it? How do you measure it? How do you teach it? Uh, yeah. Uh, so how do you teach people tools that are not cool and sexy? First, you can always lie that they're cool and sexy. <laughs> I mean, oh, okay, that's not the perfect answer, but um, as I said, when you know your goal, you can actually communicate a lot better because, okay, writing those automated tests may be not the most interesting thing in the world, but if you have those tests, you immediately know that your stuff is broken. So what I try to do, I try to actually explain all the decisions I was making to make sure that people understand them, not on the level, okay, here we need Redux, here we need React, but on level how it relates to the team. Why this is important, not just for you, but for everyone else. It's much easier now because people who spend like a year on this project, they still, they understand, like for example, why do we need documentation? Because new people are coming on board, so which might, we have to make it easier for them. Do you remember how hard it was for you when there was no documentation? So I think it's mostly in communication. Yeah. Teaching new people to code, what surprised you in terms of what they could understand easily or, or what they couldn't, they've had trouble with? Was there anything that you'd assumed would be one way and was the other and vice versa? I actually had a very interesting problem that puzzled me for a while. It's not 100% code related, but when we started planning, we had our first task, trailer board, it was a very pretty, marvelous, no one was claiming tickets. Like there were tickets and there were people who were clearly excited, like I want to work on this, I want to do this, and no one was adding their names to tickets. I started like, why? Am I not explaining something correctly? What's happening? And um, I started like investigating and I learned that they just felt uncomfortable claiming tickets on their own because it's too much responsibility. Like, I'm a junior, I know nothing. If I take this task, it will become mine and all the responsibility will become mine. So what I did actually said, look, people, don't claim the ticket on your own. Claim tickets as a couple, as a team, claim those two, three or four people. 
And it actually worked magically because they started working on tickets together and we are a remote team, so we don't, like, there is, no, there is no such thing as too much communication in the remote team. But they started working together. They started coding together. And they still do it. Like two years in the project, they're still claiming tickets like two or three people at the same time. And they find their own time, their own calendars. I'm not participating in that because uh, I sleep at that time usually. They're in the other part of the globe. But they're working together trying to solve the problem just because I gave them this chance. Like, it's too much responsibility. I'm not going to pressure you into this responsibility. I'll just give you a chance to share it. So there, there were a lot of things like that. Just they're, they're small and you don't immediately, like I'm a web developer, so I have all of this experience and I don't remember clearly what were my issues at the beginning. So just investigating a bit more, trying to figure out what, what's behind the problem that you're experiencing helped me a lot. But yeah, this ticket situation was a bit freaky at the beginning. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Uh, I was just wondering uh, what happened to all the people that have been through your program that have now left the group. Have they gone on and found commercial work? Have you, do you have an idea of where they've gone? Yes, um, uh, some of them found work. Uh, not all of them. Um, also, because we don't, uh, like, it's not just developers. We also had some artists, like, for example, two of our artists never actually worked with digital art before. There were real artists, I don't know what's the correct word for that. So they were drawing in real life and they just wanted to experiment with that. So yes, they practiced with us, they added it to, it to their resumes and they found more digital work as a result of that. Uh, we have a couple of developers who actually went to and found jobs in the industry. Um, two of our UX designers actually started with us having no prior UX knowledge and now they work as UX designers. So there are people, um, as I said, we're not forcing people to stay. If you want to come in, learn something, and then move on, that's totally fine with us. Because we're trying to build, I think at this point, building a friendly atmosphere, and uh, I probably should have said that, but the project mostly focuses, focuses on female developers, so we're, uh, all of our team is female, like focuses. There's literally no one else on the team. Uh, and so the goal was to just help them learn. So they learn what they want and they move on. That's totally fine with us. Sometimes uh, people who found jobs in the industry now, they come back and they're like, um, can you help me with Redux? Like, I'm sure let's rewrite these couple of classes for Redux and see what happens. So they still come back with questions and everything. So it's like this mentoring thing that happens. But yeah, as far as I know, uh, people are pretty happy about this. And I'm very proud of that. <laughs> okay, uh, anyone else? No, perfect. Uh, I think it's lunchtime. Sorry for taking a bit of <laughs> lunchtime. But yeah, thank you so much.